I'm Emily Chang, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the tech entrepreneur with big plans to be Maryland's next governor. Alec Ross joins us to discuss the growing divide between tech and politics and reacts to the latest Trump firestorm. Plus, our conversation with Hiroshi Lockheimer, the mind behind the most popular operating system on the planet. The Google exec joins us from the annual developers conference to map the road ahead for Android. And our extended interview with famed venture capitalist Fred Wilson. The Twitter investor tells us where he's placing his bets and why he's still bullish on Jack Dorsey. First to our lead. U.S. stocks turn in their worst performance this year. This after a memo surfaced that President Trump asked former FBI Director James Comey to drop the investigation into former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. The crisis threatens to, crisis threatens to derail the policy agenda that helped push equities to record highs as recently as Monday. Tech shares weren't immune to the sell-off. The Nasdaq tumbled the most since June of last year. And for more, we're joined now by our Bloomberg News stocks reporter Abigail Doolittle. So Abigail, talk about some of the biggest tech laggards in particular. Well, first of all, Emily, what a sell-off. As you mentioned, the worst sell-off for the major averages since September of last year, the worst of the year on this shift in sentiment. But relative to the Nasdaq, as you mentioned, underperforming both the Dow and the S&P 500 by about 80 basis points, down about 2.6% on the day. Some of the big biggest drags are the biggest tech names, including Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon. Apple down more than 3%. Its worst day in more than a year after they put up a very disappointing quarter last year. That's the magnitude of the sentiment shift here. Microsoft down in a big way. It's worst since June of last year, since the time of the Brexit. Facebook since November. So really a big turn in sentiment. And the reason this matters, Emily, is that tech has been the best sector of the year. Will this hold up? Now, relative to Apple, here we are taking a look at a three month chart and we can see that today's decline actually shows in that chart now that goes right to the heart of what's happening today and questions uh, is there a shift in faith as to whether or not President Trump will be able to put sort through some sort of tax reform? And if not, Apple could have a very difficult time or may not repatri repatriate that huge uh, cash pile. This matters, Emily, because Apple, as you know, is the biggest member weighting in both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ and a 5% weighting in the Dow. So if this sentiment continues, it could really drag on the markets. What about the chip makers, Abigail? Their losses even bigger. Huge losses there, Emily. You're right. The stocks down more than 4% on the day, being dragged on by lots of the usual suspects, AMD, NVIDIA, Texas Instruments, Broadcom. Valuation concerns here. This has really been a high-flying uh, sector, so investors taking a bite out of that today on this big risk-off day. That risk-off also shows in the NASDAQ 100 VIX up more than 40%. We've all been talking about this complacency for such a long time. It's finally started to reverse with that huge move up in the VIX. And then finally confirming all of this, Cisco plunging, Emily, in the aftermarket, down more than 7% uh, after they issued a very disappointing sales guidance for the fourth quarter. So it's going to be interesting to see whether this sell-off continues into tomorrow or if it's a one-day blip, Emily. We're going to talk a little bit more about Cisco later this hour. Abigail Doolittle, our stocks reporter in New York, thanks so much for that update. As mentioned, the volatility in the markets triggered by volatility in the White House. President Trump faces the deepest crisis of his presidency on reports that now former FBI Director James Comey wrote in a memo that the president asked him to stop investigating his first national security advisor, Michael Flynn. For more now, we're joined by Alec Ross in New York, a best New York, a best-selling author, former advisor to Secretary Hillary Clinton at the State Department, who has just announced he is running for governor in Maryland on the Democratic ticket. Alec, thank you so much for joining us. Let's get right to it. Do you think what Trump has done allegedly is grounds for impeachment? Impeachment. I do. I, I think that if he is if he is seeking to shut down an ongoing investigation by the FBI. It's just, it's a demonstration of his lack of fitness for the office. He's already proven incapable of basically the executive functions of the presidency. And now clearly, and not surprisingly to a lot of us, he's proven to just sort of lack the, the moral and ethical backbone necessary to be president. So it wouldn't be, it would not surprise me if before 2020 we have a uh, President Pence. 
So what should next steps be? An independent commission, a special prosecutor? I mean, how can, you know, this Republican Congress get behind it? Well, look, I think the obvious thing is to appoint a special counsel. And there are a few uh, Republican members of Congress who are suggesting as such. But I think that, unfortunately, too many of these folks are sort of wet finger politicians. They lick their finger, hold it up, see which way the wind is blowing. And they're afraid of their, of their pro-Trump base. So a lot of them, I think, have forgotten why they came to Washington in the first place. Uh, and I think that they're just focused on their reelection. They're just focused on their popularity. And so we'll see how many dignified men and women do come forward from both parties and insist on a special counsel. Now, Trump is the reason that you decided to run. Why? You know, I think that talent is everywhere and opportunity is not. And the simple fact of the matter is in places like coal country where I grew up, people overwhelmingly voted for Donald Trump because they felt so disconnected from our politics and from our politicians. And so the reason I'm running for governor of Maryland is to try to respond to the legitimate needs of struggling people in the working classes and try to figure out how this innovation-based economy can work for more people. Talk to me about your accomplishments, Alec. You know, what have you done that you want voters to know? Right, you know, I think that we need entrepreneurs, people who have been successful in business. Uh, getting in and doing the hard work of government. And, and I also think that as we transition from, a tech, from an industrial-based economy into an information-based, technology-rich economy, we need folks like me who have worked in that world, who understand what the really tricky policy challenges are, so that we can figure out how people in our stagnating working and middle classes can go from working in an industrial-based economy to a technology-based economy. That's what I've done for the last 23 years, and it's what I'd hope to do as a public servant. You know, tech has been proposed as sort of the solution to everything, and I know that you think that an increase in, in education and computer science will really lead to economic better, betterment, but is learning how to code really all it's going to take? Oh, no, it's absolutely all, not all that it's going to take, but I'll tell you what, computer code is the alphabet that much of the future is going to be written in. And it's important for today's kids to be literate in that language. Right now in the United States of America, there are 500,000 unfilled jobs uh, that require computer science skills. So for all the unemployment and underemployment we have, there are half a million jobs just begging for people who have very basic computing co computer coding skills to take them. 20,000 in my home state of Maryland. So I do think while making sure that every kid from kindergarten through 12th grade is computer literate. It's not going to solve all the problems, but what it is going to do is help make sure that kids from every zip code can help fill those half a million empty jobs. Speculation has swirled that Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, is considering a presidential run. Just last week, there was a report that Sam Altman of Y Combinator may be uh, considering a race for California governor. What do you make of these reports? What I make of it, it's, it's the same thing that threw me. It's the same thing that threw me into the run for governor. I think that a lot of us who care deeply about the rise of the rest, about those of us who have worked in the innovation economy and do believe that it can help more people, government's powerful. Like, you can do a lot in the private sector. You can build your workforce. You can build wealth. But there are some things that only government can do like run our public schools. And so I'm encouraged when I hear about people like Mark and Sam. I don't know if they're going to run or not. But in general, I think it's good for people who maybe have been a little in a little bit of a bubble, who have been successful, to say, you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to try to solve problems beyond just maximizing shareholder value. As long as they're not President Trump? He's a businessman, too. <laughs> well, you know, but he was a terribly unsuccessful businessman, though. I said successful businessman. He, re he inherited a couple hundred million dollars from his daddy, and if he had just put that into an index fund, he'd be a lot richer than he is today. So, no, nobody with that many bankruptcies I'm going to call successful. All right. Alec Ross, candidate for Maryland governor. Alec, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now to a story we are watching. The patent battle between Qualcomm and Apple is heating up. Now the chip company has sued assemblers of the iPhone for allegedly not paying patent royalties. Among those, Qualcomm has sued Foxconn and Pegatron. Unlike other smartphone companies, Apple doesn't have a direct license with Qualcomm. Instead, it pays contractors to make its phone, and part of that money is used to cover royalties. 
Coming up, the annual Google I.O. conference kicks off in Mountain View, California. We will hear from the man behind the company's Android operations, Hiroshi Lockheimer, next. This is Bloomberg. The Google I.O. conference is kicking off in Mountain View, California. Among the new developments, a new supercomputer chip for AI needs, and Google is making its digital assistant available on the iPhone to compete with Apple's Siri. Google also unveiled updates to Android, the dominant mobile operating system in the world. And we spoke to the man who runs Android, Hiroshi Lockheimer, Google SVP of platforms and ecosystems, about some of the most exciting announcements. We announced a lot today at I.O. Uh, you know, there are now two billion monthly active devices in the world running Android devices. That's very humbling and, and it's a huge number obviously and it's hard to even comprehend. Uh, but we're really excited about that. We also announced uh, the beta for Android O, which is our next uh, release of Android. Uh, and also we announced a new configuration of Android starting with Android O that we call Android Go, uh, which is really aimed at devices in emerging markets, you know, devices that have one gigabyte of RAM or less and really making that experience great for those users. Uh, so those are some of the examples of, of the, a lot of things that we announced today. What progress do you think you've made over the last year with Android N? So we announced Android N uh, last year and, and launched it in the fall. Uh, a number of devices have launched with Android N and many devices are now upgrading to Android N. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there and the, and the rollout continues. So with Android O, what sort of new security features are you integrating? What are you doing to combat fragmentation? Well, around fragmentation, there's a lot that we're doing. It's, it's something that we've been uh, working with the industry on for many years now. Uh, specifically, this year, we announced uh, Project Treble, what we call Project Treble, uh, which is a re-architecting of the lower layers of Android. A, a customer won't notice it, but for the industry, it's a big deal. We've completely redesigned the bottom part of Android that, that deals with the hardware to make it really easy for manufacturers and operators, the people who sell Android devices, to update these devices and, and really uh, have a, a, a sort of quicker turnaround times. And what about security? What new security precautions have you introduced? I mean, the world is weathering another global cyber attack. Yeah, so around security, we've been doing a lot uh, for many years now. Uh, one of the things we realized was a lot of what we've been doing has been behind the scenes. Um, uh, there's a lot of protections that we've put in place, obviously the architecture of Android to begin with, but also protections we put into place through Google Play. We actually scan all your apps, all apps in the world. We're scanning them all the time, but we realized no user of Android was aware that we were doing this. So we've now put uh, these systems sort of front and center for the users so they can see what we're doing uh, so that they can have a sense of security uh, and that actually reflects the real state of the world. We call that Google Play Protect and that's something that we'll be rolling out very soon. Last year you introduced something called Instant Apps which lets users stream their apps via search. Uh, what kind of progress have you made there? We've been uh, in beta with Instant Apps uh, since last I.O. We've been working with many developers on this and getting their feedback and really improving the infrastructure for that. And actually, uh, starting this week, we're expanding that so that anyone, not just the beta, uh, any developer can now develop Instant Apps, uh, which really facilitates sort of making it easier for users to get their apps without having to go through the installation process. Now, the Pixels, the new phones that Google has been making, reportedly haven't sold very well. How has that impacted Android? So Pixel is, a, is an Android phone developed by the hardware team within Google. Uh, you know, on the platform side, I work with everyone, all the manufacturers, so Samsung, I'm using a Samsung phone right now, for instance, LG, Huawei, you name them. Uh, and so, you know, we, we don't really comment on any particular device from an Android perspective. We're just happy to have more device manufacturers out there really targeting their user segments. And, and that's what makes Android great, is it's, it's really a scaled ecosystem across multiple partners. You've announced new uh, auto dashboard systems with Volvo and Audi. What is Android's strategy in the car? Well, we have a number of uh, products available for the car. Uh, the first one we call projected mode, which basically enables a customer to take their Android phone, plug it into their car, uh, and, and have, the, uh, have the phone power the car's infotainment system. That's been available now for a while now. Uh, there's hundreds of car models out there that support this already. Uh, what uh, Audi and Volvo announced is actually running Android itself 
in the car directly so that you don't need a phone anymore. Uh, and, and it's kind of a behind the scenes thing, right? It's, it's how the car manufacturers are making their cars. They happen to be using Android, which makes it possible for Android developers to bring their apps and services easier into the car environment. We're expecting a big redesign of the iPhone from Apple later this year, and I'm curious, as the head of Android, how do you brace yourself for the iPhone revamps? It's an exciting time to be a consumer because there's just so much, so much going on, so many manufacturers working on interesting innovations. And so I think it's a good thing, you know, and, and it keeps the Android manufacturers on their toes and it makes them work harder, it makes us work harder. Uh, so I, I think it's great. Are you wearing an Android smartwatch? Because I'm curious what's holding Android back in wearables. I'm wearing an Android Wear watch right now. A uh, uh, lot of progress there. We've announced a lot of fashion brands have also adopted Android Wear. We make, as you know, our, our platform available to anyone to build products on uh, products with, uh, and that's our strength. And, and we've ha we have a lot of partners now in the fashion industry as well as consumer electronics industry building Android Wear-based watches. Hiroshi Lockheimer there, Google SVP of Platforms and Ecosystems. We will have more coverage from Google I.O. later in the hour. We will speak with Scott Huffman, Google Vice President of Engineering. And coming up, shifting from hardware to software may be more challenging than expected for Cisco. Out with a disappointing fourth quarter sales forecast. We'll break down the numbers next. This is Bloomberg. Cisco shares plunging over 8% post-trading after reporting third quarter earnings. Let me show you what's going on in the terminal here. Shares down 8.37% uh, right now after hours. This after a disappointing sales forecast. Revenue was relatively in line with analyst expectations, while profit per share was slightly higher. But the company, as I said, uh, giving that disappointing forecast, highlighting the challenges facing its multi-billion dollar hardware business as the industry shifts towards cheaper software-based networking products. Joining us now from New York, Glenn O'Donnell, Forrester Research Analyst who covers the company. So what do you make uh, of the progress or lack thereof on this tra transition from hardware to software, Glenn? Well, it's, it's a long process and it's going to take a while. And I think maybe some investors are getting uh, impatient with the transition. Uh, but, it, you know, it's, it's core networking business is uh, on a slight decline, there's a lot of headwinds in that business. And moving into the software space, uh, I think Cisco is making some good progress there, but uh, it's going to take a while to offset that huge uh, amount of revenue in the networking space. Cisco is normally thought of as a bellwether for the tech industry. With all of this political uncertainty, you know, the Trump tax agenda, Cisco uh, could conceivably benefit significantly from because they have so much cash overseas. But with Trump's future potentially in question, what does that mean for Cisco? Well, I, 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 won't, I won't comment on the political landscape, but should that tax holiday come through, uh, it, it will be a, a real boon for... Uh, for Cisco shareholders. Uh, Cisco has an enormous amount of cash overseas, as do uh, other tech companies like Apple and, Mi and Microsoft. Uh, but, you know, if they can bring that back, uh, they're going to use some of it for expansion through M&A, but a lot of that's going back to the shareholders. And I think we'll see that across the tech industry. What sort of M&A are you expecting? Uh, more software. Uh, Chuck Robbins, CEO Chuck Robbins, has made it pretty clear that uh, you know th he's going to turn this company into a software company, and his his most recent acquisitions are indicative of that. Uh, App Dynamics and a few others uh, are clearly moving in that direction. So it'll be more software assets for sure, potentially some storage. But uh, there's been a lot of debate about that. Cisco did make a small acquisition called MindMeld, 125 million dollars, uh, meaning though that they're entering a very big battlefield of AI. What is the potential for Cisco when it comes to artificial intelligence? Well, every tech vendor on the planet wants to get in on the AI game, and for good reason. Uh, you know, the, the algorithms and the technology that goes into these various, uh, these various things that people like to call artificial intelligence, uh, you know, these things are the future because it gives you the ability to make sense out of enormous amounts of data, and we are swimming in data, so we have to try to make heads or tails out of the, 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 the needles in the haystack. And 
uh, you know, it gives the tech company some stickiness in the sense that, you know, for most of this technology, it's pretty easy to reverse engineer it and to compete with a, uh, a product that's like the one that you're copying. Uh, and there's a constant game of leapfrog that just keeps going on. But, you know, good analytics is sticky because it's hard to reverse engineer. You can hide a lot of the magic under the covers. And that means if you're going to buy a technology in this field, you're probably going to keep buying it for a while. And that makes, it, that makes for uh, good long-term revenue and profits for the company selling it. Now, Glenn, there's, uh, we're still feeling the ripple effects of the ransomware hack attack. Uh, clearly, there are renewed concerns around security. What does that mean for Cisco? Well, Cisco and other vendors who are in the security space, and yes, Cisco has quite a business in security. It's not just a networking company. These companies are all benefiting from you know, the mass hysteria and, and justified paranoia around this. Uh, but where we see the real future for security is building security into these technologies. And Cisco has done a lot to build security into the network. And, okay. uh, uh, and that's great, but we have to expand that baked in security across the board. All right, Glenn O'Donnell, Forrester Research Analyst on Cisco's disappointing results. Thanks so much, Glenn, for joining us. And be sure to catch our interview with Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins Thursday, 9.40 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Daybreak Americas. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Russia's President Vladimir Putin blasted U.S. politicians today for whipping up what he's calling, quote, anti-Russian sentiment. Putin spoke today in Sochi during a joint news conference with the visiting Italian prime minister. He said U.S. politicians are either, quote, dumb or dangerous for upsetting the domestic political climate. France's Emmanuel Macron announced his first government cabinet ministers today, 18 members that include those from France's left, center and right. High profile conservative Bruno Le Maire is finance minister. Socialist Jean-Yves Le Drian will be foreign minister. Edouard Philippe was named prime minister on Monday. German Chancellor Angela Merkel says a future cap on immigration for European citizens to Britain would come at a price for UK relations with the EU. That's after Prime Minister Theresa May insisted Britain must leave the bloc's single market in order to control immigration. Germany holds elections in September. The UN is stressing the importance of working together with the EU on the refugee crisis. UN Chief Antonio Guterres spoke during an address to the European Parliament. He insisted the success of the UN rests on a united Europe. Irish Prime Minister Enda Kenny retires from his post effective at midnight. He says he will continue as party leader in an acting capacity until a successor is elected. He also asked the party to expedite the process, process and have it concluded by close of business on Friday, June 2nd. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Wednesday here in Washington, 7.30 Thursday morning now in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Morning, Elisa. Well, ASX futures, you won't be surprised to learn, are pointing down and down quite sharply, about 1% lower on the U.S. turmoil. And in the spirit of unpredictability, we also have jobless figures out of Australia for April. It's an always notoriously unreliable number, but it's estimated to remain steady at 5.9%. Uh, Japanese futures are also pointing lower this morning. We are waiting on GDP numbers for the first quarter out of Japan, expecting to see half a percent growth uh, building on on the one-third percent growth that we saw in the prior quarter. A watch out for Tencent as well, uh, opening in Hong Kong today, revenue of $7.2 billion there uh, for the quarter on record, record sales and profit, and Chinese property prices for April also out. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. As we discussed at the top of the hour, it was the worst day for stocks so far this year. Major U.S. stock indexes tumbled the most in eight months, with tech stocks leading the declines. And volatility is back in a big way. The VIX skyrocketed more than 30 percent, its biggest jump since the Brexit vote last year. The corporate finance system is broken. That's what Union Square Ventures managing partner Fred Wilson had to say about early stage investing at the Techonomy conference on Wednesday. The venture capitalist says users should have access to investing in companies before they go public, not just extremely wealthy investors. Wilson's firm has invested in a number of Web 2.0 companies, including Twitter, Tumblr, Foursquare, Zynga, and Kickstarter. We caught up with Wilson at the conference and asked if the VC market is oversaturated. It's hard for me to know because I don't really know what the demand side of that equation is. I mean, it's clear to me that there's probably an order of magnitude more good investment opportunities in the venture capital industry than there was a decade ago. So that would suggest that we could manage an order of magnitude more capital. But obviously these things go up and down in cycles and we could be at a place in the cycle where there's more supply of capital than there is demand. But I think we're definitely on an upward sloping curve on both. So I, I don't know, it's hard for me to say. If there is more supply than demand, what are the implications of that? Well, I think then that what that means is that prices go up, uh, returns go down, and then capital leaves the sector, and then there's more demand than supply, and then prices go down and returns go up. That's the, that's the ebb and flow of capital markets, and that's the ebb and flow of the venture capital business. Now, I know you watch the Bloomberg Startups Barometer, which tracks the health environment, the health business environment for private tech companies. It's down from the peak in 2015. What are the negative signs you see this year? What are the positive signs you see this year? Well, I mean, I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, um, I'd say sobriety in a, in a number of, of sectors that have been very frothy in the past. Um, but we have new sectors that are now frothy. And they, you know, and so, uh, and they will have to go through their own uh, hype cycle, if you will. Twitter is one of your most prominent investments. Jack Dorsey, the CEO, just announced he's bringing back Bay Stone, one of the original co-founders. How likely is it that Twitter can reaccelerate user growth, reaccelerate revenue growth, and sustain that over the long term so that Twitter is someday significantly bigger than it is today. I'm very uh, bullish on Twitter. I should disclose that I personally own a lot of Twitter stock, uh, so I just want all those viewers out there to know that. Um, I, I think Twitter's a unique company. The, 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 the content you can get on Twitter is unlike uh, the content you can get anywhere else on the internet, uh, and that is only becoming more and more the case, uh, particularly real-time breaking news. Uh, I think anybody who wants to consume real-time breaking news, there's no better place to do it than on Twitter. Uh, and I love that the band is getting put back together. You know, Biz coming back is, is you know, when Jack came back, that was the beginning of, I think, a lot of good things for Twitter. Um, and now with Biz coming back as well, uh, wouldn't, I mean, it just, when I saw the news yesterday, I did, had no idea what was happening. When I saw the news yesterday, it just made me smile. I'm so happy about it. Snap stock plunged after its first earnings report. Facebook has been blatantly copying Snap features and deploying them across all of their products. What's your prognosis for Snapchat? Well, what's the prognosis for Facebook as a company that has no original ideas, that just tries to put, you know, innovative companies out of business by copying them? Uh, you know, I, I think that's the question to really ask. So does that mean you're optimistic about Snap's future? No, I'm just saying that it's really depressing that a company like Facebook can't come up with any new innovations on their own and just have to copy companies. Uber, obviously Uber has had its share of issues. What went wrong there? You know, I think the issue with Uber is that they believed that they could run the table on the ride-sharing market and, and capitalize the company and built a strategy around doing that. And I think what, what has turned out to be the case is that unlike search and unlike um, social media and unlike e-commerce, ride-sharing doesn't look like it's going to be a winner-take-all market. And I think that they're really uh, struggling with the realization that they're in a highly competitive market that's going to be highly competitive for the long term. And uh, 
I think a lot of the things that are happening to them are, are kind of happening because of that. Uh, I think that they become a lot more desperate. I think that they, uh, I think it's tough times there. And I think when those things happen, you see companies uh, come unglued a little bit. And that's what it looks like is happening there. How much does it come down to the leadership? What responsibility does Travis Kalanick have here? Uh, well, you know, the leaders are the ones who made the strategy and executed the strategy, and if they had the wrong strategy, then they're accountable for that, aren't they? So what is your reaction, Fred, to the latest revelation, only the latest revelation, that President Trump reportedly asked former FBI Director James Comey to drop the investigation into Michael Flynn? You know, I don't really follow this stuff. When Trump got elected, I, I uh, stopped following uh, anything to do with Trump. I mute the term on Twitter. Uh, I'm not really interested in the president, um, and I, I'm not really following any of this. I, I'm, I'm paying attention to things that matter to me, and that's not one of them. As long as Trump remains in office, how does it impact investing? How does it impact startups? Is, it, is the political climate changing anything that you're doing at USV? No, not at all. All right. So you clearly care about social issues. I've seen that you've done matching campaigns for Planned Parenthood and the ACLU. You're blogging about immigration. Diversity is a huge topic right now, diversity in VC especially. USV doesn't have any women partners. Why is that? And when do you plan to hire your first? As soon as we possibly can. How important do you think that is? Very. <laughs> so, uh, you've also vlogged about general sh generational shifts in VC. You've been doing this a long time. How long do you plan to stay in the game? Uh, as long as the game will have me. Uh, we'll see how long that is, but uh, it's, a, it's a great business to be in. Uh, I love working with uh, entrepreneurs and the teams around them. I love working on um, uh, and with important companies, and uh, I really couldn't imagine doing anything other than this in one way or another. That was Union Square Ventures co-founder Fred Wilson, legendary New York VC. In China, internet giant Tencent is showing that online spending keeps defying a slowdown in the economy. Tencent reported a better than expected 55% surge in quarterly revenue. Blockbuster video and gaming content drove a billion plus users on WeChat and QQ to spend on game items. Coming up, U.S. anti-terrorism officials banned laptops from cabins on flights from the Middle East and North Africa. Now they're worried about flights from Europe. We'll explain why next. This is Bloomberg. In today's funding board, CrowdStrike has raised $100 million in its latest funding round. The funding led by Investor Excel and values the company at more than $1 billion. It's a timely investment considering a global ransomware hack attack over the weekend that affected hundreds of thousands of computers in more than 150 countries. CrowdStrike's digital security services helped the Democratic National Committee respond to a network breach that was linked to Russia during the U.S. presidential campaigns. And another national security issue this week in focus, U.S. anti-terrorism officials met Wednesday in Brussels with their European counterparts to discuss a proposed expansion of a laptop ban in airline passenger cabins. For more on both stories, Bloomberg's Caroline High joins us now live from London. Caroline? Emily, great to be joining you as ever. And now we're joined by V-Armor Chief Cybersecurity Strategist Mark Weatherford. Now, Weatherford was previously appointed by President Obama to serve as the Department of Homeland Security's first Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity, a man who knows all of these key stories <laughs> very well. Going back to the ransomware hack attacks, wanna cry as it was dubbed, how would you rate the global response, like one out of 10? Well, I don't think the global response had an actual had time to actually evolve because it actually it stopped relatively quickly. But over the course of the weekend, you know, the, it kind of continued on. More people were found out that they had actually been uh, infected. So the the global response, I think, is more just an awareness right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the response to the event itself is still unfolding. And so where does this evolution take us? Because at the moment there's much consideration about 
who might be behind this at the moment. We're, we're at a loss as to whether it's state-backed, when North Korea comes to mind and has been talked about, whether it's a group of terrorists or hackers, or indeed whether it's a group of kids. I mean, can you illuminate any more what your world is thinking is behind this? Yeah, it's the, uh, you know, the, the um, social media and with the, within the cybersecurity community is, uh, has been lit up for the last four days. And, you know, I've seen every uh, wild imagination you can, you can possibly think of as far as who is actually responsible. And you certainly, you know, the, over the last day or so, we've heard something about North Korea, perhaps. Um, I don't think we really know, you, and, but, but I, I also believe that, um, that certain you know, government organizations are putting a lot of uh, effort into figuring it out, and they will know at some point. The U.S. being one of them, I'm sure. I'm Talk sure. to us about other places of responsibility. Do you lay blame on Microsoft, for example, not helping companies and institutions patch? Do you lay, lay, lay blame on the NSA in the U.S. for having developed this tool and let it get, get into the hands of the wrong people? Yeah, you know, I, so vendors are in a bit of a tough spot. I mean, Microsoft being the vendor in, in this case, you know, they have a you know they have a strategy for new products and new products, and then you know um, uh, uh, eliminating support for older products. And and unfortunately, in this case, many of those older products are vulnerable. Um, and you know, it, it truly is it's an economic issue for Microsoft. How long do they continue to support old products? Um, and so it, it, I, it, I, feel, I feel a little bit sorry for, for the vendor, but at the same time, you know, this is, a, um, this is an issue that, that's long been a security concern for most of us, and that is um, the, the ability of companies and consumers to be able to patch their system. I mean, back to your point, should we blame NSA? Maybe they deserve a little bit of blame, but you know, Microsoft wrote the bad code and released the bad code that had the vulnerability in it. So it, you could, you know, you can make the case that if it wasn't NSA, it, it could have been, easily been someone else that, that discovered and, and uh, exploited the vulnerability. Let's, let's talk more about tech being a weapon because the U.S. clearly has some sort of intelligence, it believes, that laptops should not be carried on planes by people because it could create some sort of terrorist incident. It is banning them on planes from the Middle East and now wants looking at extending it to Europe. Is that a legitimate concern? And what good would it be putting in, in the bottom of a plane rather than with people on, who are traveling? Yeah, uh, well, you know, is a legitimate concern. Obviously, there's something that's driving this conversation. Um, that we may not know. There's some intelligence somewhere that has highlighted the potential vulnerability of having laptops and electronic devices in the cabin of a plane. You know, I, again, I don't understand it because to me, I, I'm just as concerned about having something in the cargo hold as I am, uh, you know, in, in the cabin. Um, but perhaps there's some kind of vulnerability that takes a manual intervention you know, to make it to make it actually create an incident. I, I don't know. And Mark, you told me that you were worrying about how the way, where, how and where you would travel by U.S. to Europe if this indeed was enacted. Lastly, I want to ask you, as a man who 2011 to 2013 worked in the political churnings of Capitol Hill in the White House for President Obama at a time such as this where we see the unraveling of, of normal day-to-day -day routines within the White House because of the concerns about Donald Trump's affairs. How hard is it to do your job? Do you think the cybersecurity leading team at the White House are going to be distracted? So, uh, you know, actually that was one of the bright spots uh, in the incident this weekend. The White House, yeah. there's called the Cyber Response Group, a CRG, and they convened on Saturday and apparently I, what I've read, they worked all weekend. And I know that we had to do that a couple of times and you bring in um, experts from all the different agencies to kind of uh, yeah. get together and figure out what should be the response. I think, you know, one of the biggest factors, perhaps not in yeah. the White House, but within some of the other agencies is they haven't appointed all of the people yet that are leading these organizations, especially around cybersecurity. Mark Weatherford, wish we had longer. We wish you well with your travels back to the United States. That was Mark Weatherford, Chief Cybersecurity Strategist at V-Armor. Emily, I'm going to be sending things back to you in San Francisco. All right, Caroline, thanks so much.
Still ahead, it is all about artificial intelligence at this year's Google Developer Conference. We will grill Google's Vice President of Engineering on the company's new artificial intelligence supercomputer chip next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get back to the Google I.O. Developers Conference in Mountain View, California. With a spotlight on hardware this year, Google CEO Sundar Pichai announced a new artificial intelligence supercomputer chip looking to transform the search giant into an AI-first company and a real cloud computing contender. We caught up with Scott Huffman, Google's Vice President of Engineering, and asked just what this supercomputer chip means for Google. Well, we're really excited to be able to have the computing power to be able to really harness uh, all of the newer machine learning algorithms. One of the things that uh, is exciting about these new algorithms is they're very, what in computer science terms we talk, call highly parallelizable. So you can do many computations at once uh, and get very high scale and process a lot of data that way. Uh, and the new chips are really designed to do that from the ground up. Uh, so really designed to to do the kinds of machine learning processing that we're using a lot of. Digital assistants are all the rage now, but Google Home sales are still dwarfed by Amazon Echo. How is the Google Assistant different from Siri, different from Alexa or Cortana? So one thing that we're very excited about with the Google Assistant is the ability to actually go across all the different devices and contexts in your life. Um, so if, as you go from your uh, house to your car and your commute to out and about on your day, uh, we want the same assistant to really be available to help you in all those different places. Uh, and so today we're really excited to deploy the assistant out to all the iPhones uh, and make it available to iPhone users in the US. Uh, and we're in the process of rolling out, of course, across all the Android phones, Google Home, Android Auto, Android TV, Android Wear. So really making that, that uh, assistant always available to you no matter what you're doing. Now what is it going to take for voice technology to actually improve? Because you know, I've used all of these devices and in my own experience it's still rather crude. Well, so, uh, so we think we're making a lot of progress, uh, but one of the big things, and, and Sundar talked a little bit about it today, is really using uh, broad scale data and neural algorithms in order to, uh, to improve the technology. Uh, so we've been actually pretty significantly overhauling kind of all of our algorithms under the hood every couple years to take advantage of the new computing power that we have uh, and new and larger amounts of data. And every time that we do that, we see a pretty big jump uh, in improvement. One of the things that we did with, as we worked on bringing Google Home to the market that was really uh, an exciting thing is because Google Home needs to work at, at a distance, I might be standing far away, there's a lot more noise in the, in the microphone signal. Uh, and so by adding essentially artificial noise into our training data, we were able to have our neural network actually be able to recognize uh, things at a, at a far distance away. Uh, so these kinds of algorithms are very powerful uh, for kind of shaping recognition in different environments. What is one place that you see the assistant going where it hasn't gone yet? Today we are we're enabling a voice conversation into a great set of functionality but that uh, you know that users are doing sort of the obvious things on every device, but I don't think we fully realized yet the vision of having any kind of conversation you want, uh, having it really be understood, uh, and then having the assistant tap into all the different services in the world in a seamless way to do that. That's really the vision, uh, and so I think we have a long way to go. What, one example that we showed some beginnings of today that we're really excited about uh, is something we call Google Lens. Uh, and this is just the realization that, you know, speaking out loud is great, but when I'm talking with my friend, a lot of times what I do is point at something, and then we talk about that. We talk about what we see, uh, and with Google's advances in uh, computer vision and computer uh, kind of image understanding, the assistant is actually going to begin to have that capability over the next few months, that I'll be able to open my camera, my viewfinder, uh, and then begin to talk to the assistant about what I see. Uh, and so we're really excited about, about that. Scott Huffman there, Google's Vice President of Engineering. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Thursday, big day for tech earnings. Alibaba, Applied Materials, and Salesforce all reporting. We'll have full coverage and analysis. This is Bloomberg.